Okay, so basically, uh, we're going to be talking about um, psychological tools, what, what they call like techniques, psychological techniques or tools to change people's behavior. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the introduction, but here's the reason why we chose this topic in particular. Uh, number one, our religion is composed of two parts, ibadat and mu'amalat. Ibadat are your acts of worship, your relationship between you and your Lord. And mu'amalat, your dealings and how you behave and deal with your, your fellow Muslim and your fellow human being. And the two extremes are that you will find people focusing on one at the expense of the other. So someone will be extremely kind to people but have no relationship with their Lord. And you find this a lot when it comes to non-Muslims. And so they'll say, I'll be very good with everybody and, and treat everyone with kindness. And when I die, God should treat me well. Okay, but you have to have a relationship with Him. So it's not just treating people and ignoring your Creator. Then you have the other extreme, and this is more, you'll find it amongst our communities. You'll find someone focusing hard on the ibadat, the acts of worship, and giving little to no time to how they deal with and interact with people. And from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the man who came with mountains of good deeds because he had a lot of good worship, but he had bad treatment and bad dealings with people, he lost that whole mountain and was thrown into the fire. So that's the first thing. The other thing is that um, most people are not very conscious of how they deal and treat others. And many times people won't believe what I'm saying. So for this next week, pay attention to how many times people smile at you. And, and I'm talking in the masjid, within the Muslim community, at the halal store, wherever you go. Pay attention to how many times they'll smile and greet you. Or smile and shake your hands. So you pay attention to it and see for yourself. So they'll say very nice and sweet things to you, but no smile. But no smile whatsoever. Right? So pay attention to, to how many people actually smile. Pay attention to how many people interrupt. Pay attention to how many people don't even listen while you're talking. If you, those of you who are very aware of that, when you're talking to someone, you can tell when they're not listening to you. And it's very, very clear. And most people are not good at listening. And not good at all at listening. They told you Allah Azawajal gave you one mouth and two ears because it's twice as hard to, to listen as it is to speak. But most people don't listen. Most people are completely unaware of how they deal with others. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this room, someone at some point in your life gave you salam like this. They were busy, they were talking to someone else, they saw you, they gave you salam. Or you, I'm sure you were talking to someone and a third person came who knew that person but didn't know you and just gave them salam. We've all experienced these kinds of things. But it's really sad that that person is completely unaware of how they treat and deal with people. And those of you who pay attention to that, you will see that this is the overwhelming problem. Like the, I mean, the overwhelming majority of people have this issue. Um, there was a time when I injured my wrist, so it's wrapped up. Okay? And that brings you to pay attention even more so. How people are just are so oblivious to how they behave. So my wrist is wrapped up like this, from here to here. So I can still shake hands with it, but none of this movement. And I'm not exaggerating. People would shake your hand. And then they would notice that it's wrapped up and say, Well, salamat, what happened? Flip it around like that. That's what happened, basically. <laughs> Recently, in Ramadan in New York, one of our brothers, he had rotator cuff surgery. Anyone here experienced that? And may you never experience it, say, I mean, it's a nightmare. Re recovery nightmare, pain. So he did it in the beginning of Ramadan. We didn't see him till the end of Ramadan. And, he, and everyone knows that he's going to do the surgery. And his sons were updating us that he was in a lot of pain. He comes finally to the end of Ramadan with a sling. He said people will come up to him. The sling is here. The arm is here. People would come and go, Allah, we haven't seen you in a while. Rotator cuff is here, by the way. It's shoulder. And people would come and smack him on the arm that's in the sling. People don't pay attention to how they treat people. Um, I was in, in a country in Europe, in Scandinavia. And it, this brother was going to show me around. And he knows the history and all the museums. But all day he's doing something super annoying to me. And he's, not, he's completely oblivious to how he's treating somebody. So every time he wants to get my attention, with the back of his hand like this, he smacks me right here in the forearm. So all day. Brother, let me show you, some, and let me show you something else. All day, like this. All day. Now I'm trying to get him to realize you can't be treating people this way and you pay attention to how you behave. 
So I did something dramatic, so he notices that what he's doing is wrong. So when he would do this, I wouldn't move away like that. Maybe he won't notice that. I moved away dramatically like this. And what does he do? He just reaches over further like, to smack. It's so not acceptable, but the more you pay attention to it, the more you'll see that people, they don't pay attention and they're not aware of how they are dealing with others and how they come off to people. But here's the good part. Everybody has the ability to understand people's emotions, expressions, the way they say things, how they say things, and to intuit emotions. And the, one of the easiest examples of that, if you ever are flipping channels on the television, then you get it to a channel that's in another language, maybe in Spanish, Telemundo, whatever it is, and you don't speak that language. But you watch like four minutes of some show in that language, you, and it's a, let's say it's, a, what do you call those, soap opera. You understand exactly what's happening. Why? Because now you've lost language, so what do you do? You pay extra attention to everything else, to paying attention to body language, to facial expressions, to voice inflection, and suddenly you're aware of what's going on. Okay, so she's upset with him because he did something really, really bad. That guy over there is trying to create the peace. You figured it all out, even though you don't speak the language. Because you heightened everything else, you brought it up a notch. And that's what we want to talk about. But realistically, we want to get into some of the techniques for changing behavior. And we said these are called uh, psychological techniques, which are known as tools. And the way a tool works, when you go to Lowe's and you buy a hammer, the, the, the packaging of the hammer doesn't tell you every possible way you can use a hammer. You understand how a hammer works, and then you use your creativity to, to uh, make a, you know, take advantage of that tool. So for example, you buy the hammer and you can use it to drive in a nail. Then you can use the other side to pull up a nail. Then you've got ice you need to break. You break the ice with it. You need to discipline your child. The point is you use, of course we're kidding, right? You use your, your creativity based on how you know the tool works. So what I'm going to try to do, and without stretching it too long, is give at least maybe 11 psychological strategies or tools to changing behavior. And now it's up to you to take this tool and apply it in completely different scenarios. In some of them, I'll give you completely different scenarios. In others, you're going to use them with coworkers, you're going to use them with your children, with spouses or with siblings, whatever it is, it's up to you. It's a tool, you can use it in any way you want. So, number one. So, number one is that you res the person that you're dealing with, that you're trying to change or what have you, you need to respect their intelligence. And treat them in that way, that you, tr you respect their intelligence. This works wonderfully with youth also. You respect their intelligence, they live up to the expectation that you have of them. Because psychologists tell you, that human beings, we have the need for order and consistency. So if I think you're smart, and I tell people that I really think that person is smart, and they tell you, you will always try to act smart in front of me because you want to remain consistent with what I think of you. So when you respect someone's intelligence, they live up to that expectation and that standard. There are many examples of this, but one of the best stories is that uh, it's a true story. It's this uh, young lady, and she was studying to become a teacher. She graduated from the university and she got her first teaching position. That school that she joined, the, there was a classroom of the worst failures ever. D's and F's and they don't do their homework, they don't attend class, horrible class. All the, stu the teachers knew them over the years and no teacher wanted to deal with them. So the principal, because this is, you know, this is a new person, doesn't know the school, gave her that class, said, you teach that class. Nobody told her it's the worst class or anything. At the beginning of the school year, the principal gives her the names of the students and a three-digit number next to the name of each student. And in a few months, they're doing, they've got straight A's and B's, and they're doing their homework, and they're writing essays and literature, and they're reading books, and they're showing up at school on time and not skipping class. So the principal was amazed because for years and years, they're just dragging this class from one class to the next, and they're barely able to pass that grade. And now they're getting A's in a few months, and this inexperienced teacher, how could, what, is, what technique does she have? The best teachers couldn't do it. So he called her, the principal called her to his office. And he said, I gave you the worst class in the history of this school. For years, we, they just barely make it to the next grade. And our best, most experienced teachers couldn't deal with them. How did you do it? She said, I didn't do anything. I just treated them 
based on their IQ level. I spoke to them based on their IQ level. He said, what IQ level and how did you even know their IQ level? She said, the paper you gave me at the beginning of the school year that had their name and the, and the number next to it. He said, those were their locker numbers. <laughs> but she thought, she, so she would read, you know, Jesse this and 160. He's a genius. And she didn't tell him, hey, you're a genius or oh, your IQ number is high. She never said that. She just spoke to him like he was a genius. And he caught on to that. And there's so many studies, I don't have time to get into them, but they're beautiful studies where they give someone the wrong information about somebody and they have them speak to them over the phone. And subconsciously in their voice, because they think they're talking to this in incredible person, they, they treat them that way, but it's subconscious. And then they interview that person and he felt better from the phone call. And that person treated them better just because of what they thought of them. So here, she never said, this is your IQ number. And they would have said, well, how do you know it? But she would see 150, 155, 145. And she started to treat them like they were intelligent. And they lived up to it. And it's as simple as that. And that's why those of you who have traveled a lot, you go overseas and sometimes you find young men who are 15 years old, but they behave like a grown man. And they don't lose their innocence or childhood or any of that dramatic stuff. They still enjoy themselves and they enjoy their childhood, but they behave very, very maturely. And then you go to other countries and you find someone in their 40s and they're still playing video games and still this and that and still can't manage finances. Well, I'll tell you something. <laughs> so, so I grew up, I grew up around the world, okay? And uh, I came to America in 96. After going to Europe and many places, my father was a diplomat. And, and I used to listen to this show where this psychologist, people will call her and then they tell her their problems and she'll help them. And I remember, I used to be surprised at people's age. I mean, the guy will call and he's asking for help with something. Hello, Dr. Laura. I, said, I have a problem. Okay, what's your problem? He'll tell her the problem. Bismillah. I'm like 19 listening to this or something. Okay. And then, and how old are you? I'm 45. 45? Jid inta Your grandfather. Okay, anyways. The point is, why do, why do some people mature so quickly? Because they're treated as such. What's proof that the Prophet ﷺ, and during that time, they treated young men that way? First of all, look at the ages of the companions when they became Muslim. Zubayr ibn Awam was 15. Talha ibn Ubaidullah, 16. Uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, 17. I mean, they're young men. And they went and gave them da'wah because they considered them young men. Another proof, during the Battle of Badr, the army advances a little bit. Then the Nabi Sallallahu inspects the troops, the soldiers. And he takes the kids out, what we would call kids today. Like 11 and 12 and 13 and some 14-year-olds were taken out. The question really is, why was the 12-year-old in the army to begin with? That's the question. And the answer is that in that society, the 12-year-old was treated like a young man, so he felt capable. If you treat someone like they're capable, they live up to it. And if you treat them like they're a child and they're incapable, or, you know, magically when you become 18, you'll become a man and you become mature suddenly, or 21, that's the next obstacle. They're all mental blocks. You treat someone like they're intelligent, they live up to that expectation. And that's why they tell you when a child does something wrong, you tell them that was a naughty thing you did. You don't call him a naughty boy. It's just the action that was bad. It was a bad thing you did. Not you're a bad boy. Because then that's how they will see themselves. All right? So that's number one. Whoever you're dealing with, whoever it is, treat them and, and with, like you respect their intelligence. The second technique is to readjust goals. If you want to change someone's behavior, you change their goals. Why? Because... Behavior is linked to a goal. So this is a true story. Young man wants to become a professional soccer player. What do you think he's doing all the time? How is he spending his time? He's playing soccer, training, watching it, reading about it, talking about it, even playing it on his video game. That's it. It's all about soccer. His father wants him to become a businessman and study business and read about business and look at the news for stocks and this and that. Do you think it's going to happen? It will never happen because your actions are linked to a goal. Your actions are linked to a goal. You want to become a singer? Guess what your actions will look like? Singing in the shower, singing, but singing all the time. And writing poetry and maybe learning an instrument. It's linked to the goal. So the father kept nagging the child. Study business. Read about business. Look at this. Read this journal. And the child is not interested in it because they have another goal. 
So one way to change behavior is to readjust the goal. And this was a technique that was used by a very wise woman, the mother of Imam Malik, rahimahullah, and rahimahullah. When Imam Malik, as you know, when he was a young boy, what did he want to become? A singer. So what do singers do? He'll be spending time with poets and writers and, and people who write melodies who, and instruments and sing in the shower and sing all day. And by nagging him, she's not going to change that behavior. So she did it because she was a wise woman. She readjusted his goals. And she took him from wanting to become a singer to wanting to become a, a young scholar or a scholar. And she did some very interesting thing. She dressed him up like a young scholar. And this is what we do to our children now, right? We go and buy them the, the doctor kit from the, from the toy store. And so they come with a stethoscope and they check everyone's heartbeat. And then they've got, you know, little scalpels and they've got little syringes and they give everyone shots in the house. Or we make them fall in love with being a police officer. So they get the, the little badge and the stick and they go around hitting black people and shooting people. Okay, we're kidding. So, but the point is, they, <laughs> they fall in love with that profession. Or they want to become a firefighter or a vet. She dressed him up like a little sheikh. So he was, he was so young that she couldn't let him go to the masjid for fajr on his own. It was too dark and it was too small. She used to accompany him. So you can imagine how young he was. And she dressed him like a little sheikh if you could see him now. And I always say, I would love one day after the Jum'ah khutbah, a father will bring his son or his daughter up on the mimbar. Tell him, look, you're the sheikh. Speak to people. Make them love the profession just like we make them love being a doctor and whatever, buy them the military things and all that stuff. So she made him love being a scholar and want to be and to become a scholar. And she dressed him up for the part and she supported him. So naturally, he stopped singing. Right? Your actions are linked to a goal. If his goal now is to become a great scholar of Islam, what do you think his actions would be? Halaqat and memorization and dhikr and learning and, and so on. So you're, she was able to completely change his actions without any nagging and just by readjusting his goals. And goals or actions are always linked to a goal. So sometimes you're able to readjust the goals and you can fix a lot of problems. You can even apply this, like we actually applied this with a co-worker of ours a long time ago. And he basically, his, his goal was to have to live a fun life or a happy life. But he confused happiness with fun. And as you know, fun is short-lived, right? So someone goes to the amusement park, they get on a roller coaster, they scream as they're coming down the roller coaster. But when they get in the van to drive home, they're not screaming on the way home either. Because the fun is gone, it's short-lived. And happiness is a longer, more resounding feeling. So his, he confused fun and happiness, and his goal was to have a happy life by having a lot of fun. So his goal was to always go to this party and that party and be kayaking and doing, doing all these kinds of things constantly. And so we want basic or, or we just wanted to readjust his goal from wanting to live life like that running around to a better goal which is to have a relationship with your creator. So the question and it's just a very simple. You're not going to be impressed by this but it's just using the same technique. So I said okay. So you're 26 years old and you've been to a lot of parties and you've had a lot of fun right? As we're sitting here right now having lunch, this was a coworker. Do you have any of that with you right now? All those memories, all the fun, so many parties, you've probably forgotten a lot of them. That you have nothing to take from this right now, right? He said, yeah, it's just all memories. Some of them are gone and everything. I said, okay. So what would you rather that you become a 60-year-old man and you look back at your life and it's just memories that were lost that you cannot benefit from? Or would you rather invest your time in something that will help you after you die? And he said, you're right. All the fun I've had until now, it's just memories and I've forgotten a lot of it and there's nothing I can benefit from right now. So, wouldn't it make, we asked him now, wouldn't it make sense for you to invest your time in worshiping your Creator so that when you die, you've got a life of obedience to Allah and a relationship with Allah? And this guy, like we would describe him as what people call an airhead, you know? And he really was someone like that. Every sentence began, ended with, and had the word dude in the middle, you know? And now, this guy who is just so fun-oriented, suddenly is realizing the logic of, make, of investing your time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similar, just readjusting the goal can change all the parting. Nagging doesn't work. Actually, nagging kills. And that's why men die before women. The point is, okay, 
So, we're just kidding, right, sisters? Now, there are many other techniques. One of them is to get people to set their own goals and their own objectives or their own solutions. Now, I want to show where I learned this technique and completely different scenarios where we've applied the technique. Because we're talking about tools, and you can take a tool and apply it in a completely different scenario. So, I was taking a class on um, research methods. And the professor did something very strange. At the beginning of the semester, he allowed us to set our grading scale. He said, so you know the grading scale the professor gives you at the beginning of the year that says the midterm is 25% of the grade, homework is 10% of your grade, attendance is that percent. That's the grading scale, right? So he said, you can set the grading scale as you like. As long as the class agrees upon it, I'm fine with it. So obviously, we set it so that it's really, really easy to get an A in that class. And we decided that the final exam is going to be 4% of the grade. Which, like, who cares? Uh, nobody studied for that final. It was multiple guess anyways. We were just drawing shapes and who cares? And, you know, attendance was already a big part of the... Uh, cl if you just attend and do the homework, you'll pass this class. But... I couldn't understand why he would allow us to disregard his exam and, and his final exam in such a way. Nobody bothered to ask him. So I went to his office. I said, why would you allow us to not care about your final exam in such a way? It's 4% of the grade. Nobody cares about your exam now. And he said, and remember the class is research methods. He says, research shows that when you allow people to set their own goals, to set their own objectives, they make a much greater effort to reach those goals than if you just tell them, this is what your, your goal is, try to reach it. Allow them to set their own goals. So now this is the technique that, that he is giving me now, and I'm going to apply it in completely different scenarios. And this is, back then I was a chaplain of George Mason University. So, you know, chaplain, you have to deal with all, you know, issues on campus. It's kind of like imam, you do the counseling, chaplain does the same thing. So the sister comes, and she's in tears, and she has a problem. What's her problem? She works full-time, she's doing her PhD, she's married, she has one son, and she has all the responsibilities of the home, plus school, plus work, plus the child, and her husband just sits on the couch. Once they get home, he sits on the couch, he starts flipping channels, and she has to do everything. You know, the mopping, the cleaning, the vacuuming, the laundry, the cooking and the child and putting him to bed and everything, plus her homework and research, whatever she needs to do, and get ready for, for things tomorrow. He just sits on the couch flipping channels. And then while she's trying to do a thousand things, if she, the, the food is a little bit overcooked, or it comes to him, to his highness, not hot enough or whatever, he throws a fit and he get, you know, gets angry and how dare you. Okay. So I asked her a question. I even felt silly after asking her this question. I said, have you ever asked him to help you? And she said, yes, I asked him to help. So what happened? She said, he helps for a day or two, and then he goes back to sitting on the couch and yelling at me. Okay. So now we're going to use the same technique from the professor, even though the professor didn't say you can use this technique to help a woman whose husband is lazy or whatever. He, you take the tool and you apply it in completely different scenarios. So I told her, okay, you go home with a pen and paper, sit down, and you list all the chores that have to be done in the house. And mashallah, women are very good at listing, right? So I have to do this and this and this and this and just list the whole thing. Now you know this is impossible. I can't do all this and go to school and work full time. You have to help me out. So what are, will you, what are you going to do around the house? And whatever he gives you, if you're satisfied with it, fine. If you're not satisfied, increase. So if he just says, I'll do the dishes, tell him, no, there's still this and this and this. Okay, okay, fine. Until you're satisfi satisfied with the chores that he's chosen for himself, now you fold that piece of paper up, you put it in your pocket, and that piece of paper has transformed now. It has become what? A license to nag. Why? Because we know what he's going to do. You remember his pattern. Every two days or three days, he helps out for two, three days, then he goes back to sitting on the couch. So I know he's going to do it, right? So... Now, and I told her, when he comes back after two or three days and is sitting on the couch again, you can come now with a white glove and examine it and inspect his work. There's still some dust here. What is this? And he didn't vacuum and he didn't do the laundry. When he erupts and has a fit, tell him, wait a minute. 
I didn't ask you to do these things. Take out the piece of paper. You said you're going to do these things. And where is it? So, it may work, it may not work, right? So she comes back two months later, big smile on her face. He's still doing his chores and he's doing a good job, alhamdulillah. Example of a tool used in a completely different scenario. Another scenario for the same tool. I went to a masjid in California and they had put like what they call backboard, yani these hoops for basketball. They put these hoops in the, in the parking lot of the masjid so that the youth, instead of playing in the parks where there are drugs and problems and fights, they want them to be playing near the masjid. But they said, this is the problem we have now. The youth keep playing, and when they hear the adhan for maghrib, they keep playing. One team is beating us by one point, so they keep playing. And then they hear the iqama for maghrib, and they keep playing. The first rak'ah, they keep playing. Second rak'ah, and then by the third rak'ah, they start running, trying to make wudu, and some, some of them catch the last rak'ah, some of them miss the entire salah. The great thing is, in the meantime, uncles and, and, and older people and brothers would come as they park their car and they see that the youth are playing while they can hear the, the, the salah. What do you think they tell them? Hmm? Aywa. Same thing. Everyone just frowns at them and yells out one word. What, what word is that? Yes, or in different languages. So. Namaz! Salah! Prayer! Prayer! And so on. That you're not adding any new information. They heard the, the adhan, the iqama, takbirat al-ihram. They know it's salah. Like when you say salah, they're not going to say, oh, that's what that uh, yelling was about. Bismillah, I didn't know that. They know that. You're not adding new information. So they said, how can we fix this problem? And I said, what have you tried in the past? And you won't believe this. They said, we took the ball away. Really? And each one of them has five balls at least in their trunk. And took the ball away. All right. So he said, okay, this is what you do. You sit down with them. And this is another technique in communicating, right? Where you agree, you start with points that you agree upon and you get yeses from the person. So they, you sit them down and you say, let's agree that we all know, you know, when you're playing sports, this team is beating you by one point. You try to get that point back. It's a very, very strong pull. You want to get that score back and all that. So it's a strong pull, but so it's going to pull you away from Salah. Let's all agree that Salah is more important than this. And this is not some championship game. We'll find you a fatwa to combine if there's a championship game. This is just a regular game in the parking lot. So we need to find a way to break that strong pull. And then you get them to give the suggestions. And you're going to moderate. And as you moderate, you might even be the one giving the suggestions, but you're just pointing them in the right direction. So you'll tell them, okay, so how do we stop? How do we get you to stop on time? And they might agree on things like, for example, when we hear the first Allahu Akbar of the Adhan, that's the equivalent to the referee's whistle. And when the referee whistles, no one starts, keeps still running with the ball. Khalas, it's over. Whoever won, won. Whoever lost, lost. So the first takbira is the equivalent of the whistle. Whoever wins at that point is the one that's winning and so on. You don't try to recover points or anything like that. Get them to give you a, a number of good suggestions. Then ask them for a punishment if they don't stop on time. What will their punishment be? And have them suggest the punishment. And moderate it so it doesn't get too crazy. Like if they say, take down the backboards for six months, that's not good. Because we don't want them to go play in the park for six months. The whole idea is to keep them here. So the punishment might be something like they'll do, you know, pick up trash from around the masjid, whatever it is. Same tool, but used in a completely different scenario. And that's why you can use it, like I said, with coworkers, siblings, children, whoever you think of. All right. Um, the other, another way to get people to change their behavior is to ask for their help with a problem similar to theirs. So this is hypothetical. So you're, you're teaching a weekend Quran class and a mother comes to you and says, my son, Ahmad, he's 14, he's in your class, but he hits his older sister. His sister is 16 years old, he hits her at home. And so now I need you to talk to Ahmad, please. So you could talk to Ahmad directly. Your mother said this to me. Or you can try another technique. And the other technique is to, tell, to ask for Ahmad's help with a young man who hits his older sister. So you'd come and tell him, look, Ahmad, uh, I need your help and your suggestions for a problem because the boy has a problem is about your age. And you, you know how they think and so you might give me some good pointers. So he's about 14 years old and he hits his older sister. So what do you think I can tell him so he could stop this bad behavior? So Ahmad now is going to give you suggestions. He's going to tell you, Tell them about the hadith that he's not from amongst us who does not respect the elderly and have mercy on the young. 
He's gonna, what's going to happen to him? As every time he's telling the hadith, the Muslim is the one whose people are safe from their tongue and their hands. And, okay. As he's telling you this, he's going to feel bad. He's going to feel hypocritical, like a hypocrite. Because when what you say goes against your actions or the opposite, you feel bad about that. So every time he gives you a suggestion on what to tell that imaginary kid, he's feeling more guilty because of what he's doing. And he's got two options. And he's going to pick the, the, the easier one, which is to change the behavior. Change the behavior. So they, this, this is obviously, sometimes you try a technique and it doesn't work. But you have a whole arsenal of techniques with you. And you're going to try a different one. But this could very well work because hypocrisy is a very strong feeling and doesn't make us comfortable. And psychologists refer to something called cognitive dissonance, right? And it's basically when your behavior and your actions don't agree. Your, your actions go up opposite or against how, what you behave, what you believe. So for example, your belief, sorry. If somebody believes that stealing is haram and immoral, and then he steals, how bad will he feel? Versus someone who believes that stealing is not stealing. Stealing is opportunity and unprotected risk that Allah has put in your path. Yeah. This guy, if he steals, do you think he'll feel bad? He won't feel bad. So when somebody then does something that goes against their belief, so the person who steals now, it goes against his belief, he's got two options. Human beings, we don't like to live uncomfortable like that. So he's got two options to remove the discomfort. One, change his behavior. Stop stealing, he'll feel better. Two, change the belief. When he changes the belief, suddenly stealing is not haram and it's not bad. And or even cheating is not haram. I know, I know a lot of Muslim students like, this is, uh, this is dunya, this is not deen. So they cheat and they copy homework from each other. Oh, so that's how it works. Yani, there's a fatwa. If it's deen, don't cheat. If it's dunya, bismillah. This, banks are dunya. We rob banks now. So then people change the behavior, the pe change the belief. And that's why you will find the smoker, it's not haram, it's what? It's makroh. Why is it makroh? Because he's a smoker. That's why. Yeah? And everyone, the issue that's close to them, they defend it. You know? If so, if someone doesn't care about smoking at all, but he deals with whatever. I don't know. An example that's not... Uh, whatever. Let's say he deals with riba, for example. So you tell him, by the way, smoking is haram. So like, yeah, nah, of course it's haram. Because he doesn't smoke. Tell him dealing with this kind of uh, transaction is haram. But brother, you know, in order to be viable in the 21st century, uh, uh, okay. the other guy is the opposite. He doesn't care about that transaction. He doesn't deal with it. Tell him it's haram. Ah, alhamdulillah, I don't, haram, it's haram. Tell him smoking, he'll defend it. Because that's what he's attached to, right? Okay, are we supposed to be done or what? Time flew quickly. Taib, we'll do one more technique and then uh, let me choose it carefully then. We'll do one more technique. I didn't think it would be 8.15 so quickly. Hmm? Well, by the way, this, this last one here, this last technique that we mentioned, there's a, narra there's a story that's a very famous story, but it, is, it has a weak narration. I mean, there's a weakness in its chain. But it's a very famous story of when Al Hassan and Al Hussein, the grandchildren of the Prophet, <laughs> Naam. Yeah. yeah, justifies it. Yeah, absolutely. So and it doesn't even have to be religious justification. And there's so, there's so much in this field. There's something called post-dissonance, which is like buyer's remorse, basically. You buy something silly from the mall. You come back home. You don't really need it. It's a very bad purchase, very bad price. So what do you do? You justify. Yes, I have a lot of ties, and I need a, a tie shredder. You, know? you justify it. You know? And, there, and, and in the same field, there's something called selective attention, selective retention. And that's when you hear the arguments that agree with you. Okay? Or you only remember the arguments that agree with you. So, uh, and this happens a lot with debates. You know? So if there's a debate, let's say there's a debate on halal meat. Halal meat versus the biha meat. We have a debate here at Click. One group says everything is halal, the other group says everything is haram. And if you're sitting in the audience and you believe the meat is all halal, you're, the halal guy will win 